Hi, we're gonna be talking about the diagnosis of abdominal aortic aneurysm, and specifically how to diagnose and manage this in the emergency department. So we'll start out here with a case study. So this is a 67-year-old male presenting to the emergency department with right flank and abdominal pain, which began suddenly about one hour prior to his arrival. He has a history of hypertension and elevated cholesterol, and also has an extensive smoking history. His initial vital signs concern you. His blood pressure is 90 over 52, his heart rate is 115, respiratory rate of 14, and his oxygen saturation is 98% on room air. His temperature is 37.1, and you're astutely concerned about ruptured AAA. You're worried because of his symptoms that he's presenting with, as well as his vital signs. So we're gonna talk about what makes you worried about it, and what are also the best initial tests or interventions to obtain for this patient. So what we wanna do for him. Because abdominal aortic aneurysm is a life-threatening condition, so we wanna make sure that we're thinking and acting very quickly. So what are the risk factors? What makes us think about this more in a patient? So it appears in older people generally, so older than 60 years of age, and it's more common in men rather than women. Oftentimes there's associated peripheral arterial disease, so patients in this situation may have a known history of claudication in their legs or decreased blood flow to their legs, or possibly even have had some procedures related to that. Approximately 18% have a family history of aortic aneurysm, indicating that there's potentially some familial relation here. Risk also increases with smoking, and interestingly enough, it decreases with the number of years since quitting. So patients who quit potentially can have their risk go down lower. Now the classic presenting history, so what is the classic thing that patients who are presenting with AAA will walk through the door with? So the most classic thing is back pain. It's the most common presenting symptom. Now in the emergency department, you can imagine that this really is a challenge for us. A lot of people come to the emergency department for back pain. So trying to figure out who is at risk and in whom we should be concerned about this actually isn't as straightforward as that original patient case presentation. It can also present with sudden onset of flank or abdominal pain. Again, lots of patients come to the ED for these complaints. So sorting out in whom we have to worry about this life-threatening condition can be challenging. Syncope, or an episode of passing out, occurs in about 10% of patients. So there will be a small proportion of patients, especially those in whom there's already been rupture or uh, contained rupture of a AAA that may pass out. And this is like our group of patients who are presenting with some hemodynamic compromise usually. Chest pain is the other part, because along with AAA, there can also be problems with the aorta within the chest cavity. So we're talking about the aorta that runs through the abdominal cavity, but keep in mind that the aorta is a large blood vessel that starts from the heart and goes all the way through the thoracic aorta and into the abdomen. And shock is the last part. So patients may present hypotensive, they may present with an elevated heart rate, and when your aorta ruptures, you know that generally pretty quickly, uh, or your body recognizes that quickly. And since it is such a large blood vessel, you can lose immense amounts of blood into your abdominal cavity in a very short period of time. Now our work up here, again, we wanna go back to our ABCs. We wanna go back to assessing the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation. We don't wanna move on until we've addressed one of those complaints. The classic problem here is most likely gonna be a circulatory problem, although there may be a problem with the airway or the breathing. The circulatory problem is most likely due to sudden and severe blood loss. So for that patient, you wanna make sure that you're addressing that circulatory problem before you move on, or that you're addressing it while you're moving on to additional interventions. You wanna do a physical examination. So you wanna take a look at your patient, you wanna to listen to their heart and their lungs, you wanna feel their abdomen. You wanna try and feel for a palpable aorta. As the aorta gets larger, uh, it will be more readily palpable because it will be a larger structure in the abdomen. And it will feel like pulsations, like what you would expect the aorta to feel like. Generally, if you can feel a big aorta, that's a bad sign for the patient. The last thing you can do is you wanna think about ultrasound or imaging of the patient. In the emergency department, like we've mentioned before, there is readily accessible ultrasound machines usually. And with those machines, you can bring them right to the bedside and you can go ahead and you can take a look at the patient's aorta. It's a quick and rapid and easy test that you can get. 
Other things that you can see on your physical examination are evidence of retroperitoneal bleeding. Keep in mind that the aorta is a retroperitoneal organ, so you may see evidence of some of these elements. Cullen sign is peri-umbilical ecchymosis. So that's basically ecchymosis or an appearance of a bruise around the umbilicus, around the belly button. Gray Turner sign is ecchymosis in the flank area, so ecchymosis in the back. Again, it illustrates the fact that you really wanna make sure you're taking a good look at your patients. Now, what should we do for imaging? Now, if we're very worried about this condition where the patient has a known history of AAA and they come in and they're very unstable, one of the first things you wanna do is you wanna get a surgical consultation. So you wanna get your surgeon who's on call on the phone and let them know your concerns. You wanna involve them early, you wanna make sure that they're aware of your concerns and you wanna make sure that they know that you potentially want them to come in and evaluate the patient and possibly even take the patient to the operating room. The next thing you can do is you can get a plain abdominal film. Now, to be perfectly honest with you, this isn't something that we do super regularly in the ED when we're looking for a AAA, but you could potentially see a calcified aorta. And obviously, calcification in the aorta will make you concerned about further atherosclerosis or disease of the aorta. The other testing you can do is CT imaging. Now, CT imaging is ideally done with IV contrast. And when you do it with IV contrast, you're able to get the most information. Now, that's not to say that if you can't administer IV contrast for your patient that you shouldn't do the test at all, because a non-contrast study can actually still give you some information. The CT with IV contrast, though, is going to be the thing that's going to give you the best look at your anatomy. It's going to be the thing that's going to show you most accurately whether there's a false lumen, whether the um, aorta is ruptured. It's going to give you the most accurate information. Ultrasound is the last test or, you know, the other test that you should be thinking about. Ultrasound is great for patients who have hemodynamic compromise because, again, the ultrasound machine can be brought to the bedside of the patient. The patient doesn't have to go anywhere or leave the emergency department. So if your patient is unstable in any way, this is your test of choice, really. It has a greater than 90% sensitivity if it's a technically adequate study. Ultrasound, if you remember, is based on whose hands it's in. So it's based on operator dependence and operator experience. So someone who's very good at performing ultrasounds will likely have a more sensitive test. It also depends a little bit on the patient's body habitus. So patients who are obese or overweight, or they have a lot of overlying bowel gas from their aorta, it may be more challenging to see what you're looking for. You know, just a reminder, the normal size of the aorta in the abdomen is about three centimeters. And when we're looking at the aorta with ultrasound, we measure from the outside wall of the aorta to the outside wall. You wanna measure in both longitudinal and transverse views. So you wanna get a couple of different pictures in order to make sure that you know what you're looking at. Obesity, tenderness in the belly can definitely limit your ability to perform this because you're pushing on the abdomen from the outside and bowel gas may limit the ability to get a good look at the aorta. Because of the location of the aorta, all the intestines, overlay it, so it can sometimes be hard to get that posterior view. Again, best for the unstable patient, as it can be performed at the bedside. And the other thing that's good about ultrasound is that it's performed more frequently or very readily by emergency medicine physicians and is a big part of our training. So sometimes you don't even have to wait for the ultrasound tech from radiology to come and help you out with that study. Now, CT scan again, ideally done with IV contrast. On the CT scan picture, you could see that there is the original aorta, which is the bright white area in the center, and then the large area surrounding that is the area of aneurysm, the grayish area that surrounds. A CT scan without IV contrast still can get you a look, but might not necessarily tell you if there's active bleeding or get you as good of an anatomy picture as the others. Now, CT is a good test for stable patients because CT, while it gives us lots of information and is a great test, the patient still needs to go ahead and leave the emergency department. One of the worst things an emergency medicine physician can ever hear is a code, code blue or a cardiac arrest patient in the CT scanner. That's something that you never want to hear. Now, it does it happen. It does from time to time, but ideally you want to make sure that you're selecting those patients who are going to the CT scanner and that you're sending the appropriate patient to the CT scan because you don't want your patient who's unstable to go there and then become more critically ill and have an arrest or a bad outcome in the scanner. 
So our first steps here, a surgical consultation. You wanna get that as soon as the diagnosis is suspected. Never delay in a patient with hypotension or while awaiting imaging. I can't stress this enough. If you are worried about this diagnosis, you call a surgeon. This isn't something you can fix in the emergency department. This is something that will need emergent surgery. One thing you can do is you can ensure that your patient gets adequate resuscitation. What you wanna do in that situation is you wanna put in two large bore IVs. You wanna send a type and cross match for your patient. You wanna potentially give early blood. So you wanna start volume resuscitating the patient nice and early. Two large bore IVs, just for clarification, generally you want something that's an 18 gauge IV or bigger, so an 18, a 16, or a 14. I always like to remind students that volume resuscitating with a triple lumen catheter is not ideal. The lumens actually on a triple lumen catheter are really quite small and long, and you don't get a lot of great flow through that. If you're worried about your patient not having good peripheral IV access, you can also put in an interosseous catheter or a cordis, which is basically a large central line. And that would be how you would get a better volume resuscitation. The other thing that's important to note is that permissive hypotension actually may have a better outcome. So just maintaining the person's systolic blood pressure of around 90 may be okay. So we wanna make sure that we're not resuscitating the patients too early necessarily, that it's okay if their blood pressure is around 90. Other testing to get would be potentially other EKGs or labs, looking for other causes of presenting symptoms. So although we're talking about AAA here, it's possible that the patient's symptoms may not be due to AAA. It's possible they're due to other concerning findings. So you wanna make sure that you're, again, keeping your differential broad and not coming upon early closure for this diagnosis. You know, size matters when we're talking about AAA. Three to five centimeter AAAs are less likely to rupture. So if you get your imaging and that's the size that you see, you can advise that your patient has outpatient follow-up. Now, sometimes that's easier said than done, but really try and get that patient plugged in to see a vascular surgeon. Greater than five centimeters requires urgent follow-up with a surgeon. And what that means is generally surgery follow-up within three to five days. These patients are actually at pretty high risk of rupture or greater risk of rupture than the smaller sizes. So you wanna make sure that you go ahead and you stress to the patient the importance that they go see someone and also that when they're discharged that you give them good return precautions. Now, always keep in mind that if your patient doesn't have the resources or doesn't have health insurance or the ability to see a doctor, that you make sure that they have some ability to kind of get in with an individual. And then for a patient in whom you're, has a symptomatic or ruptured AAA, you wanna get that emergent surgical consultation. You wanna involve that surgeon, again, nice and early, but definitely if you're worried that someone is symptomatic or the imaging shows that there's rupture, go ahead and call your surgeon who's on call. If you're at a facility where there's not the ability to repair um, the AAA, go ahead and work on getting that patient emergently transferred to another facility. Now, there are a few options for repair. We're not going to go into them in too much detail here because we're not talking about a vascular surgery course, but basically endovascular versus open repair are the two options. Uh, in the most recent years, the endovascular or the less invasive treatment has become more readily available or more um, commonly used for patients versus the open repair. And obviously that has the advantage of it just being less um, invasive and potentially better for a patient. Now, the vascular surgeon will discuss that and select the appropriate treatment with the patient. So going back to our case here, uh, so what are the best tests for this gentleman? So first of all, first and foremost, we wanna maintain a high level of suspicion for this diagnosis. While we may be thinking about other things, could he have a kidney stone? Could he have pancreatitis? Could he have muscular back pain? For the most part, you wanna think about in the ED, the differential of consequence. What is highest on your differential of consequence? And here, what we're talking about is the triple A. So you're talking about an aortic aneurysm and potentially a ruptured aortic aneurysm. Involve your surgeon early. For the most part, the surgeons wanna know about this early so they can start planning. And if you have that high level of suspicion, get them on the phone, get them involved in the case. For patients who have hemodynamic compromise, like this gentleman, doing a bedside ultrasound 
to take a look at the aorta is going to be a key initial study. So it's going to be a key thing that you can go ahead and take a look at and see whether or not there's further concern. Definitely, if you're still worried and your ultrasound looks reassuring, potentially you want to move on to get that CAT scan when your patient is more stable. So the conclusion here is remember to keep this on your differential. Can masquerade as a lot more benign conditions, so always make sure that you're thinking about it. You want to assess hemodynamic stability when thinking about the imaging modality. For a less stable patient, go ahead and get that ultrasound first. For a patient who's a little bit more stable, a CT scan with IV contrast may be a good first choice test. You also want to involve your surgeon early, uh, especially when you have a high level of suspicion for the diagnosis. Sometimes there's no need to wait for that imaging test to come back. Bedside ultrasound patient, for patients though who are unstable, has a pretty high sensitivity for AAA if you get a good study, if you're able to get a good look at the aorta. And it's also important to remember that size matters. So that's gonna affect what ultimately you're gonna do for your patient. If the uh, aneurysm is small, the patient can have outpatient follow-up in a non-emergent way. Somewhere in the middle, you wanna get them urgent follow-up. And then for those symptomatic patients, so for patients who are having pain related to their AAA, or definitely for those patients who are ruptured, that's something that requires emergent treatment. That's something one who requires a trip to the operating room. <music>